shout and touch the Lord as He passes by. You find He's not too busy to hear your cry. He's passing by this moment your needs to supply. Reach out. Let's open our Bibles tonight to the Old Testament book of Psalms. We're going to look at Psalm number one, and the title that I've put to this psalm, and we have put to it, is The Godly and the Ungodly. Psalm one, the godly and the ungodly. We're going to see in verses one to three that the godly are blessed, and then in verses four through six, the ungodly are cursed. God makes it very simple, and he opens up with this psalm to let us know the contrast of a godly life and an ungodly life. Now, by way of background, for those that might not know, a psalm is a song, and uh, these were the songs that were sung in Israel. It was their songbook. It was their hymnal. And some of these are quite long, and uh, some of them are very short, like this one. But these are the songs that they sang to the Lord. And uh, this, they had uh, the instruments that accompanied it. It was also their devotional guide on how to live. And there are 150 songs uh, covering many, many topics, building their faith and building the worship within their hearts. I wonder what they're singing in heaven. Could it be some of these psalms? Oh, we have all eternity to explore these and so many others. So honey, would you open us in prayer, please? Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for the opportunity to listen and read your word today. We ask that you would prepare our hearts and prepare those who are listening and those who will listen in the future. Come Holy Spirit, we welcome you to take over this service. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen and amen. When I uh, went out to Indianapolis, uh, Indiana, 30 years ago to take a course in verse-by-verse teaching or inductive Bible study. Uh, The very first assignment that we had in the class was Psalm 1. And we must have spent the whole morning on Psalm 1. We're not going to spend all that time on it right now, but there is so much richness here. And I was thinking about the the Bible and about how we should read it. Uh, Now, when I look at news online or what have you, I'm a skimmer. And I think maybe you are too. I skim, looking for the things that'll stand out. But don't skim the word. I thought about um, going to McDonald's for a fine meal, sitting down with a Big Mac and fries, and slowly savoring the taste of the Big Mac and the fries. (laughs) I don't think so. But if you go to a fine restaurant, or you watch people on television eating fine food or drinking wine, what, what do they do? Beer drinkers go gulp, but the, the wine drinkers, they kind of taste it, they sniff it, they just, they get as much out of it as they possibly can. I don't drink, so that's not something I know by experience, but that's what I see on television. But I know no fine food, and I want to savor it. Well, let's savor this. Let's not just do the McDonald's approach. With all due respect, we all do McDonald's at times. We do sin, don't we? We have to confess it. But Really savor the word. Don't just read over it. Don't skim it. Really, we're going to mine this for the next uh, 20 minutes or so. So, honey, if you'll read uh, Psalm 1, beginning with verse 1, right through to verse 6. Sure. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his, and in his law he meditates on it day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish." So it's pretty simple. Three verses to talk about what happens to the godly. Three verses to talk about what happens to the ungodly. 
as we're training up children, we have very easy contrasts. Do what's right, mommy and daddy are going to be pleased with you. Do what's wrong, not so. And so it is in life. We have choices, don't we? We always have choices to do the right thing and the wrong mm -hmm. thing. Now, the definition uh, in the Old Testament for the godly would be those who observed the law and showed their faith through that. But for us, our godliness is in Christ. He's the one who died for our sins, shed his blood for our sins and our unrighteousness. The Apostle Paul tells us in the book of Romans that he was delivered up on the cross for our trespasses. And then he was raised from the dead for our justification. Amen. So for us, the godly are those who are in Christ, walking with the Lord. If they make mistakes, they ask forgiveness and are experiencing the cleansing blood of the Lord. The ungodly are those who are not. That's right. Now, it doesn't mean that uh, there are a lot of folks out there who are doing good works, but they don't know the Lord. But, and that's good. good to, better do good works than bad works. And so some of the supplies there. But really, to be godly means to be in Christ and to be walking in his righteousness. It doesn't mean just to say a sinner's prayer, but to be following him, really following him. Unfortunately, in this country, 75% of the people claim to be Christians. But then when you ask 10 simple questions put out by the different companies like Barna and Gallup and others, do you trust in Christ alone for your salvation? Do you read the word? Do you pray? Do you give? Do you attend services? 10% can answer those questions. So those who are righteous, not so many. But let's make sure that we know the Lord. We're going to give you a chance to receive Christ before we're finished. Let's get into Psalm 1. Blessed, you know what the word blessed means? It means happy. When you are going to do God's way, God's will, you're happy. Blessed is the man, or happy is the man, who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly or the wicked. He's not walking in their counsel. He's not listening to them. So we're going to take the slow approach. We're not going to wolf this burger down like McDonald's. We're going to savor it like a fine piece of meat or vegetables at a fine French restaurant. Think about this. Happy is the man or the woman or the child who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. You're not looking for ungodly counsel. You're looking for godly counsel. Mm -hmm. Where do you find that? In the Word of God. In the Word of God, as Kelly said. You, this is going to be your counsel. That's why we're here. That's why you folks came out tonight, and that's why you folks are watching or will watch us on television or f Facebook or YouTube, whatever, in the future. So you're not walking in the counsel of the ungodly, nor are you standing in the path of sinners. You're not standing with them. You're not doing the things that they do. You're not appreciating it. It doesn't mean just doing. It also means approving. So I don't mm -hmm. commit adultery, but I like to watch movies of others committing adultery. I don't rob, but I like to read books about robbing. No, you are actually participating in mm. it. That's kind of hard, isn't it, Jerry? No, Jesus said, you know, it's not just looking, it's not just touching a woman, but looking upon her with lust in your heart. It's what's in your heart. Watch what you're doing and what you're approving of others doing. So you're not walking in the counsel of the ungodly or the wicked. You're not standing in the path of sinners. You're not sitting in the seat of the scornful. Who are the scornful? Those who scorn the Lord. Those who scorn the Lord's ways. Those who sin. When you and I sin, we scorn his ways. Born again, tongue talking, tithe paying, pulpit preaching. And yet when you sin, you are scorning the Lord and his word. And so we need to make sure that we're not in this path. So look at the progression. First of all, this person is walking with the ungodly. You walk long enough and you're going to end up standing and hanging out with the sinners. Hang out a little bit longer and you're now sitting with the scornful. You see the progression there? Mm. First of all, you're walking, then you're standing, and now you're sitting. Yep. So I'm going to just hang out and just walk with somebody a little bit while. It's not going to rub off on me. Well, you start to hang out with that person. The next thing you know, you're not only walking, now you're standing with them. 
And then it's going to lead to uh, sitting with them and being just like them. There's the old story about the frog going into the uh, pot on the stove and the water is lukewarm, it's temperature. They don't know when it boils, right? It doesn't bother him at all. He's in that water and then you slowly turn up the heat until the next thing before he even knows it, Mm. you're going to have frog for dinner. And so it is with us. You don't know it in the beginning. You're just just walking with the, uh, you're just listening to it on radio, television, whatever, listening to others. My favorite saying, as you've heard me say before, that sin takes you farther than you want to go keeps you longer than you want to stay. Okay, I want to get out of this now. And you can't get out of it. Have you ever been in a sin like that? And it doesn't just happen uh, it, it, uh, instantly. It takes time. You it's don't really, slowly, you know, you just, and then all of a sudden you're in that sin. It just creeps up on you. It just creeps up on you. Mm-hmm. Don't start. It's better it's, just, uh, just that's, not. This, this is the person who's happy. He doesn't get involved in these things. He doesn't walk. He doesn't stand. He doesn't sit with those who are sinners. What does he do? That's the negative side. He doesn't do those things. I will not do those things. Well, that's putting off, as you like to say. Put off and put on. You're putting off that desire to walk with the ungodly, putting off standing in the path of sinners, putting off sitting in the seat of the scornful, but you've got to put something on, right? What are you, what are you putting on? Verse 2. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. So that's what you're putting on. You're putting on the law. You're putting on God's word. How many of you ate today? Did you have any food today? Oh, I love to eat, don't you? That's your nourishment. You can skip a meal for a day. Two days you begin to feel it. Unless you're fasting and God's protecting you, you're going to really start feeling it after a few days. How about those that never get into God's Word? To me, that's like never eating. I I would die. Well, they don't know what good food is. And God's food is good food. His delight is in the law of the Lord. Do you have delight in God's word? Do you delight to get into his word? Yes. It's his love letter. My mother used to say, this Bible is his love letter to us. Remember that first person you loved? My wife. You, you loved that love letter, didn't you? This is the love letter from Jesus to you and to me. And you delight in that. There may come a time when you don't delight in it. I've been teaching the word now for 40 plus years. There have been two or three times in my life in the middle of ministry that I got a little dry and I just really was saying, Lord, I'm getting dry. You know what I did? I confessed it. Lord, I'm dry. I'm not really interested as Don't much as I used to this. be. Don't want to do this. Change my heart. Put it in my heart to love your word. And he would do it every single time. Because we are sinners. Sometimes he gave me a new translation to read. Sometimes instead of reading it, I would listen to it on the the iPhone or something else. Uh, He'd find a different way to have the same food. Do you like chicken? Prepared the same way every single day for the rest of your life. Do you like potatoes? One way and one way only. Variety. So there's no harm in having uh, a little, little change and another translation. And it can just get liven you up. And I like to look at five and six translations at a time when I'm researching. And I get some different insights that way. Mm-hmm. So your delight is in God's word because that's his love letter for you. And in his mm-hmm. law, he meditates. Day and night. Day and night. That's that uh, antithesis of the McDonald's burger, gulp, gulp, gulp. I think a Big Mac should be eaten in no fewer than three swallows. Bom, bom, bom. But fine food, you take your time and savor it. I ordered online a special uh, s- series of soups. Uh, <laughs> since I'm, I'm not going to restaurants, I've been going online searching. Uh, I came across a site called Gold Belly, G-O-L-D-B-E-L-L-Y. And they, they bring food in from all over the country. Some of them are free shipping. And I get these soups in there. I thought I liked tomato soup. Campbell's tomato soup. Open one Until can, tried theirs. put one can of water or one can of milk. Hallelujah, we're having a great party. <laughs> This tomato soup, a little onion, a little this, a little something green in there, whatever it is. But how much sodium was in there? Nah, let's not discuss that. <laughs> he brought it home to me, I said, nah. <laughs> but I, I was enjoying it before, before this, this meeting tonight. I was just really, I said, that's a fine cup of soup. How about God's word? I was, see, I was meditating on that soup. Meditate on his word. Day and night, think about it. Think about his word. How many stomachs does a cow have? 
four? Do they have? Oh, I forgot. Is that right? I know we it's more than one, right? We researched that, Ed. Ed's our researcher. I think there's four stomachs. And we know what a, how a cow chews the cud. You know what it does. It eats the grass mm -hmm. and then savors it and puts it in one stomach. It says, hey, that was pretty good. Brings it back up again. And he begins to chew it all over again. Drops it in stomach number two. Mmm, that was really good. I think I'll enjoy that again. Brings it up. You get the idea, don't you? Meditate on his word. Think about it and apply it to your life. What Kelly and I are doing here is not just reading the word and explaining it, but we're showing you how to do this on your own. Don't just gulp it down like McDonald's. Poor McDonald's. I'm really picking on get them tonight. Get off McDonald's, Jim. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> get, uh, now, what, what, what else? The, the godly person's delighting in his law. He's also uh, like a tree. Look at verse 3. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he does shall prosper. That reminds me of the, the tree of life. Doesn't it, though? Yeah. Think about that. He, he should be like a tree planted by channels. Can you imagine having a tree right water. by the river? You know how the river... Yep. You know, the and so Achilles right. That's going to be the scene here in Revelation. This, this, when you get to heaven... Uh, you're going to see this in Revelation chapter 22. Uh, you're going to see this uh, in verse 1. Let's pick at Revelation uh, 22 verse 1. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Ooh, Boy, isn't not that just amazing? There's, yeah. there's the healing for the That's nations right. right there. It's not only <clears throat> for eating, but it's for healing. Uh, and that gets into the area of health. I like healing when I'm sick, but I'd much rather have health and not get sick. Right. And so here's an idea. Is there a connection between what I eat and my health? Yeah, you hear that all over the news, don't you? You are what you eat. Lord, help us to eat healthy food. Don't bring that death by chocolate home. <laughs> that's, that's her favorite ice cream from Stuart. He was going to bring it home, and I said, don't bring it home this she week. She has a son who's a little suspicious, superstitious about these things. He will not buy, he'll buy her chocolate, but not death by chocolate. <laughs> he doesn't want to get into that death thing. Anyway, it's good stuff. But... Um, be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Now, what is water in our spiritual application? That's Jesus. That's the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit. Jesus, on the day of tabernacles, Feast of Tabernacles, the last day, the day that they would pour water down the steps of the temple, right. talked about the Spirit of God, the water that's bubbling up within you. Unless and, you're born of the water and the Spirit. And, the Spirit. and so, planted by the rivers of water, in heaven, I'll be able to see that tree of life as you talked about in Revelation 22. But what about here? Where's the water? It's the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm Pentecostal by background, and I certainly believe in tongues, and I speak in tongues. But tongues is not, it may be the initial physical evidence of the baptism in the Spirit. But to be in the Spirit and keeping the Spirit is not speaking in tongues. It means being controlled by the Holy Spirit. Mm. Whether you speak in tongues or not, are you controlled by the Holy Spirit? Is he leading your life? Is he directing your life? If so, you're planted by the rivers of water. Lord, I want to be planted by rivers of water. But now I go out there and I sin. Forgive me, Lord. I need to get back to the water. And so you go back to the rivers of water. And what happens with that? When you're planted by the rivers of water, what happens to your life? That brings forth its fruit in its season. Oh, you're going to get fruit. But I'm not seeing the fruit of the Spirit. Well, because you're not being watered. You're not being watered. The Holy Spirit's not watering us and we're not bringing forth the fruit. What is the fruit of the Spirit? Paul talks about that in Galatians 5, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. He tells us this is the evidence of the Christian life. Mm -hmm. And uh, we need to have this fruit coming forth in our lives. And Revel uh, Galatians 5, verse 22, tells us the yep. fruit of the Holy Spirit. For the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against there, such there is no law. 
So that's the fruit of the Spirit. That's the evidence of the Christian life. It's love, joy, peace, etc. That's that the evidence. That nice word is in there, long-suffering. Mm, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and this, this word gentleness is also translated meekness. Yes. Not arrogance, not pride. I'm going to do it my way kind of an attitude, but yielding to the Lord. Lord, I want to have the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Well, how do I have the fruit of the Holy Spirit? You need to be watered. And watered you, by the Lord. And you need to be meditate day and night. There's your connection. You're so right. you have to meditate. You have to be in the Word. You have to stay in the Word. You have to be in the Word. And it's work. Now, for young people, it's a lot of work because they'd rather play, right? Yeah. And I have been a Christian a long time. And I have to tell you, my spirit hasn't changed that much. I'm not that I like to play, but, you know, I struggle sometimes. Once I'm in that, I'm like, oh, I'm so glad I did that. That's right. You but, have to work. <clears throat> but yeah, I, you know, work. there's a part of me that just wants to move on and clean the kitchen and do whatever. But the Word of God is what makes us well, mentally, physically, spiritually. And this, if we could, I, I, I want to tell people sometimes that if you really could only understand that this is it, and do I always live this myself? No, because I struggle just like everyone else. But this is what's life, every part of it. So we need to hold on to it. There's a part in the Bible that it says, eat the Word of God. That's right. That's right. Now, <clears throat> if you are going to be in the Word of God, watered by the Lord, yes. you're going to bear fruit, your leaf is not going to wither, you're going to look beautiful. Amen. Leaves are, are protection, they are beauty, and it's not going to wither. And whatever you do shall prosper. Whoa. Isn't that beautiful? Whatever you do is going to be successful Whoa. because it's done in the Lord by His Word. Wow. What about the ungodly? And we've got to bring this program to a close, but I don't want to spend much time on the ungodly. No. I want to spend more time with the godly. Right. But we need to read it anyway. Verse 4. The ungodly are not so. Now, you're not going to get all this. You're not going to get the fruit. You're not going to get the leaf that doesn't wither. You're not going to get the prosperity. Well, they're the not prosperity. planted by the river of water. That's right. So I mean, they're not getting the living water. That's right. Right? That's the living right. water is Jesus. He's the and water the, of life. They're not getting watered. That's right. And so their leaves wither. Right? So what happens to them? The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. So by contrast with the ungodly, they're like the chaff which the wind drives away. You know what the chaff is, don't you? Mm -hmm. In those days they would take their wheat or whatever it was and they would bang it against a stone and they would uh, separate the wheat from the chaff. And the wheat would fall to the ground, and the chaff, they would just lift up with a fork, and the wind would just blow it away. That's a good prayer to pray. My friend Patty, some of you remember Patty, she taught me to pray that prayer. That is such a good prayer. Pray that prayer. The chaff, which the wind drives away. You're not going to have any There's substance. There's something going on in your life, yeah. someone that's really you know, bothering you or something. Pray, Lord, drive them away like chaff in the wind. That's right. And the Lord will do it. He honors his word. Now, the ungodly are not going to stand in the judgment. You're not going to be able to stand before the Lord. They will not be in heaven. They are not going to be at the judgment seat of Christ in heaven for rewards. They're going to be at the white throne judgment, Revelation tells us, where they're going to be judged for their sins and cast into eternal damnation uh, in, in Gehenna, the lake of fire. That's why when we get mad at the people, even me, when I get mad at like maybe a governor or whatever, whoever you're mad at today, think about judgment and think about praying for mercy for them, right? We have to pray for mercy for everyone. And then sinners are not going to be in the congregation of the righteous. Oh, they can come into our churches, they can be in our pulpits, they can be our leaders, but they're not going to be with us in heaven for eternity. The Lord knows the way of the righteous. He knows all that we do. And the way of the ungodly shall perish. So those who are in Christ are the godly. Those who are not are ungodly. But if you're in Christ, you can still do ungodly things 
And you need to ask God's forgiveness for that. Amen. Let's Amen. close it in prayer, shall we, dear? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this precious word. We ask, Lord, that we would live holy before you. And Lord, if there is any sin that is uh, besetting us, help us, Lord, to put that off and put on the righteousness of Christ. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful evening in the Lord. Bye-bye. Let's open our Bibles tonight to the Old Testament book of Psalms. We're going to look at Psalm number two as we talk about the Messiah's triumph. Amen. The triumph of the Lord Jesus Christ. So find your Bible if you can, if it's handy. And it's Psalm number two, we're going to go through it verse by verse. And we're going to see in this uh, Psalm, the first three verses talk about man rebelling. We know about our rebellious oh. heart, don't we? So we see the rebellion of man in verses 1 to 3. We see God responding to that rebellion in verses 4 to 6. And then we're going to see the reign of the Messiah in verses 7 through 12. The Messiah's triumph. Let's open in prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day and for this precious word. We ask that you be with us now and be with those who are listening now and those who will listen in the future. Help us to be truly changed by your word. We ask for the Holy Spirit to come and take over this service. We ask these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen. Psalm number two, the Messiah's triumph and his glorious kingdom. Kelly's going to read all 12 verses then we're going to go back and talk about it. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king, O oh, my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, be wise, O kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are all those who put their trust in him. Amen. This is about the uh, triumph of the Messiah. And we, we talk about Jesus being Lord. We talk about giving our hearts to him, and one day he's going to rule and reign. But as you look around in the world, it doesn't seem like he's reigning, it doesn't seem like he's ruling. And even in our lives, sometimes we say, Lord, where are you? But, but he's reigning. But he's reigning, and there's going to become a time when he takes over. Revelation talks about that. He's giving us time right now. He's delaying his coming, and why is he delaying his coming? Mercy. 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 Are you glad he's God, delaying his coming? He's not willing that any should perish, but is. all come to repentance. That's right. People forget that. Sure. Oh, I wish the Lord had, would come. Yes, we do. If the Lord had come 80 years ago, where would you be? If he had come 50 years ago, where would you be? If he had come 20 years ago, would you be saved? I would. So thank you. So it's 20 years for you, but for many not. And so even right now, the... The final number is not there. When that last person comes to the Lord, he's coming. No question about it. But let's look at what's happening here. Right now, it looks like uh, most of the world is really against him. There are almost 8 billion people right now in the world. Uh, 1, 1, 1, 100,000 Roman Catholics, 900 million uh, Protestants, call it 2 billion altogether. They claim to have a relationship with Jesus of some sort. Probably mm -hmm. it's nowhere near that number. Maybe 10% is a more accurate figure, but that still leaves six billion who don't claim any relationship with Jesus as far as savior. What's gonna to happen to them? So these, these, right, right now, most of the world is not embracing Christ as king. That's a fair statement. But 
I'm not casting stones. I'm not pointing figures. I'm looking at my own life and saying, Jerry, do you always install Jesus as king in your life? Is he always leading you? Not really. But there's room for growth there. Let's read verse 1, honey. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? So the nations here would be the goyim, the, uh, the Gentiles. Uh, for in our parlance today, we would talk about the unbeliever. Uh, why do the unbelievers rage? Uh, that means they're, being, they're, they're, they're tumultuous, they're angry, they're fulfilled with themselves, filled with pride and arrogance. And the people are plotting a vain thing, a worthless, empty thing. Well, this reminds us of the Tower of Babel, doesn't it? They were trying to build a tower to get up to heaven to be like God. And well, didn't, didn't the Lord say that if all those people come together, anything could be done? That's right. Yes. That's why God <laughs> took their language and, and uh, broke it all up. So we're not, I, you know, I have to stick that out here. Whenever I think about that, I always think that we're all not supposed to be the same. That's why God made us different. We're all trying to be the same. I don't think we're supposed to be the same. Maybe that's not a good thing. We wouldn't have balance. Maybe it's good that we have different ethnicities, different nationalities, different beliefs. It's, you know, and we have to find, Je we all want to find Jesus, right? We want everyone to find That's Jesus. That's where the unity has to be in it's, Christ. It's in Christ. That's it's not in come. everything else. That's right. So the, the nations, nations are raging. Uh, it goes back to Eve right in the garden. What did Satan say to her? Eat of this fruit and you'll be wise like God. So there, there comes there's the that trick. Old, there's old, old That's nation, the trick. Yeah. That's an old delusion there. So, uh, Satan's always up to something. That's right. Now the nations are raging and plotting a vain thing to replace God and to be their own leaders. Well, guess what? Every time you and I sin, we're doing the same thing. When you and I sin, we are saying, I'm in charge. I did it my way instead of God's Rebellion. way. Rebellion. That's right. Now the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. So they're taking counsel against God, the leaders, and they represent all of us. And every, again, every time you and I sin, we're taking counsel against the anointed. The anointed is, of course, Jesus. It means the one who's commissioned the one who is Savior, the one who is Messiah. But I know what is going to come soon. Doesn't he laugh? Yeah, and he will. <laughs> he will. Yes. So here's the attitude they have in verse 3. Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. Yeah, we, we, we don't want the Lord to, to, to bind me. I feel restricted. I could see them all together here. Yeah. Gathering against the Lord and his anointed. That's right. They're going to gather together. They're going to plot. They've got it all figured out. And they're going to do their deeds. And look at verse 3. They're, 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 they're going to break the bonds of God and the Messiah and cast away their cords from us. I'm not going to let God restrict me. I don't want to become a Christian. I can't do this. I can't do I'm that. Gonna I can't loose. have my freedom. I'm going to get I'm out gonna of break it. Loose. I'm going to move out of your house. That's right. That's children. Not all, but I'm going to do it my way. And that's puppies, right? It's just that independent spirit. And again, when you and I sin, we're in the same position. So Lord, help me to become submissive. Maybe I should read Rachel this at night when I go to bed. <laughs> that's her dog, yeah. So they're trying to break the bonds. Well, verse 4, <clears throat> God's reaction now is going to be how he responds to this rebellion. So basically all human beings, apart from Christ, are rebellious. The heart of man is desperately wicked, and who can know it, Jeremiah said. There's rebellion. Search me, O Lord, and show me That's right. there is any wicked thing within me. It comes me. right down from Adam and Eve. Right off the bat, they just rebelled against God and did their own thing. Well, here's God's response, verse 4. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. So there's that laughter you talked about. Yep. He laughs. Right. He laughs when you gather. When people, that's why when I see people gathering together and thinking they're gonna, they're gonna do it their way. I'm I thinking, know. oh, you don't have a clue. You should really just get on your knees and ask God to yeah. show me the way, <laughs> because He knows. And it's not if it's not of God, it's gonna fall apart. Because God knows the outcome. We we have uh, a few, quite a few dogs. I've learned. <laughs> and, I've learned uh, the character of God over yeah, these years. That's right. 
Well, one of the dogs we have is in the back room there. He's beautiful, 126-pound uh, dog. He's gorgeous. He's a 126-pound Savoyed. He he's a nice narcissist. And, and he's a total narcissist. And uh, How did he get like he, that? He is so smart. I say, come, and he goes. I tell Whatever I tell him to do, he knows exactly what to do, and he does the opposite. So I just simply have a leash, and I smile. I walk over, and I'll say, we're going to do it my way, and I'll bring him to where I want to. Well, that's how God feels about it. Oh, you're going to be rebellious? I got a leash here, and you're going to come my way. So before I came tonight, I, I pick up my leash for my one dog, Rachel. She sees the leash in my hand. She goes, whew. <laughs> Couldn't find her in the house. Found her in the bathroom laying by the tub, hiding. <laughs> All right, so God's, God's going to laugh at us in our rebellion. And let's go on to verse 5. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king, oh, my holy hill, so, on my holy hill of giant. I didn't know if you wanted me to keep going. Yeah, that's right. So he looks at the rebellion and uh, he says, uh, I've got a solution for this. My king, my Jesus is going to be on the holy hill of, of Zion. Zion. So all this rebellion that's going on today, all the, uh, the nonsense as you listen to the worldly scene, uh, we think we have problems in our country, oh, Myanmar right now, and some of the other countries in Africa, uh, rebellion, the military taking over. Uh, it's all sin. Things. It's all rebellion. It's all the devil. It's all rebellion. Devil in the heart of all, all these people. And even in us, it's always fighting against doing what we're supposed to do. We have to understand that truly we are sinners. So that's a good point. Now look at verse 6, and let's apply that to our lives. We read verse 6. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. All right, so the context here is he's saying, I have set Jesus, my son, the king, in Jerusalem to rule the world and to stop that rebellion. How do I apply that to my heart today? Wow. Lord, I'm being rebellious. I'm sinning. Set Jesus on the throne of my heart and help me to stop this rebellion. I've heard you say that. Apply it before. to our lives. Lord, I'm sitting. There's a, a wonderful um, uh, book by Roy Hessian called Not I But Christ. I read it about 40 years ago and it was wonderful. It talks about the throne of our heart. And I'm sitting on the throne of my heart much of the time when I'm sinning. Mm. But I want to say, not I, but Christ. I descend the throne of my heart. Jesus, please ascend the throne of my heart and be Lord and cure me of this rebellion. And honestly, you know what? I can't trust my own heart. No. no, no. Sometimes you're walking really good with the, the Lord. The heart of the Lord, the heart of the man is desperately wicked. Who can know it? Who can know it? Who, who we really it? can't trust our own heart, but we can trust the Word of God. That's right. You can trust God, not ourselves. That's right. Even when we think we're doing so good, and I'm such a Christian, and I obey the rules, and I go to church, and I'm kind to everybody at work, and I'm a nice person, that doesn't mean anything because sin hides. And it can, I always say, with me, it rears its ugly head. And then all of a sudden I know, well, you know, I don't always catch it, but you, we, you can feel it. It's rebellion. That's right. That's right. Rebellion. And the Bible says that rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Mm -hmm. So we saw in the first three verses, the rebellion of man. We see in verses four through six, God's response, mm -hmm. and he's laughing at our rebellion, and he is setting up his son, the king, in the appointed time in Jerusalem to reign the world. We appreciate all efforts for unity, all efforts for peace. We appreciate the United Nations. We appreciate Democrats and Republicans doing whatever they're doing. Let them do whatever they gotta nations. do. But real peace, and in families too, real peace is going to come Through when Jesus. Jesus is sitting on the throne. Because when Jesus is on the throne, there's peace. That's right. And there's order. And there's order. That's right. That, that's going to be the uh, absolute. If Kelly and I have differences of opinion on things, it's Jesus that brings us back into mm -hmm. unity. Not that we're never going to be able to solve it apart from him. Never going to. And oh, we, we talk about uh, Israel and the Palestinians. We're going to get it all worked out. We talk about the Middle East and, and, uh, and the, the different uh, uh, countries there. There will not be peace until the Prince of Peace is reigning 
on the throne of our hearts and, and in their hearts and in Jerusalem. And try to tell, you know, Jews or Palestinians that I have friends both. And I mean, I mean, I certainly wouldn't try to tell them that unless they asked me because um, I respect, you know, their views. Um, but I know what the Word of God says, and it doesn't really take a whole lot to watch what's going on. There's never peace between them. No. And though there wasn't in the Old Testament uh, with, with the two sons of Abraham and with all of us. So there's really no peace uh, apart from the Prince of Peace. But you know, the even your relatives and your family. If, the, if they're not in Christ together, you're not going to have the peace of the Lord. Uh, in your, you may be peaceful, but you haven't got the peace of God apart from Jesus. No, and this is in the Old Testament. Remember that. This is in the Old Testament. All right, let's look at verses 7 through 12 as we see Messiah reigning now in the world. I will declare the decree the Lord has said to me, you are my son. This is the Father talking, talking to, to the Son. Talk about the deity of Jesus Christ. Jehovah's Witnesses will ring your doorbell on a Saturday and say Jesus is not God. Christian science that I was raised in said he was not God. And on and on. Mormons say he's not God. Yes, if God is God, his Son is God. If, God, if the Father is deity, the Son is deity, you are my Son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. So the Father says, I will give you the nations. Ask of me, and I'll give them to you. One day all these nations will come under the control of the Lord Jesus. It's called the millennium. You and I are going to be here, and you and I are going to be with him as he breaks rebellion with a rod of iron. So is he going to actually break the, the, the nations up? No, it just means he's going to be breaking their rebellion up. Okay. That's what they do in court when they send someone to prison. They have broken that rebellion, put that person in bondage. Won't that be wonderful? Yeah. Now, what will I be doing in the millennium? What will you be doing? You're going to be helping him to break them with a rod of iron and dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. You and I are going to be policemen. We're going to be policemen, state troopers, in the Lord's kingdom because not all of them are going to love the Lord. On the first day of the millennium, all are saved, but as soon as that first minute of that first day of the millennium, a newborn baby cries, and who knows what's in that baby's heart. And so you and I are going to be here to help enforce the rule of Messiah for 1,000 years in the millennium. And now verse 10. Now therefore be wise, O kings, be instructed, you judges of the earth, Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are all those who put their trust in him. So here's the solution. If you don't want to have your head broken open <laughs> like, uh, and dashed to pieces, you don't want to have to experience the wrath of the Lord, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Amen. We come to the Lord, we yield to the Lord, we ask Him to be our Lord and Savior. Yes. Well, fear doesn't necessarily mean being afraid of, some of the commentators say. Yes, it does. Fear in the Old Testament, fear in the New Testament. In the Greek, in the New Testament, you know what the word for fear is? Phobos. We talk about a phobia. So the, I, fear of the, the fear of the Lord is the beginning you know, of wisdom. When I was obedient in home as a child, I respected mom and dad. When I was disobedient with mom and dad, I feared them. I got the strap, I got the whip. Maybe you did too, maybe you didn't. Back in those days we did. Fear is fear. So you have the fear of the Lord, you come to him, you submit to him, you kiss the son lest he be angry. You come to Jesus and you kiss him and that's a picture of submitting to him. It actually means not only to embrace, it means to like fully prostrate hmm. yourself before the Lord. Get down with your face in the carpet and say, you are God. I serve you willingly. You kiss the Son, lest he be angry with you and judge you and cast you into the lake of fire. And his wrath is kindled but a little. So blessed are all those who put their trust in him. You put your trust in him, you fear him, you're not going to have to suffer the consequences of the nations who are having their heads popped open like a coconut. All this is prophetic. It hasn't happened yet. 
But it's going to happen one day. Philippians gives us a little picture of it from the Apostle Paul about Jesus and uh, the submission to him. Right now it looks like people just use his name in vain and, and are cavalier about it. Uh, I was watching a television program uh, the other night of a fellow over in Italy. He's experienced, he's Italian actor and he's, he's experiencing uh, the Italian food and it's so wonderful. And he just, he, th- he just blurts out the Lord's name and, and, uh, and, a, and a few other profanities right on the television here. No, it, let's have respect for him. And talking about humility, he talks about Jesus. He made himself of no reputation. We find in Philippians chapter two, uh, he was found in appearance like a man. He humbled himself and he went to the cross and died for us. Verse 9 shows the exaltation we've been talking about tonight in Psalm 2. He humbles himself, submits to the cross, and now verse 9. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. That's going to happen one day, but let this day be the one for you, dear friend. If you don't know the Lord, if you haven't kissed the Son, if you're not coming to Him and submitting to Him and trusting in Him, do so now. And you've sat under the Word tonight. That's right. Confess that He's Lord. Confess that He's your Lord. And confess this to the glory of God the Father. And wash yourself daily in the word of God. Amen. Close us in prayer. Would you be? Father, we thank you and praise you for what you've done tonight. We ask you to be with us. Bring us all home safely. Thank you for those who are listening, those who will listen in the future. Bless them, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. by this moment